Okay, welcome back. I hope everybody is doing wonderfully today. We're going to be talking about chapter two, which is looking at some of the key characteristics that you find in cancer cells. And in chapter one, we talked about this uh, definition, how do you define cancer? We said, you know, at the surface, you could say it's uncontrolled cell growth and proliferation, but that really doesn't take into account the huge number of contributing factors that help lead to cancer. And of course, if we want to come at this from a biological perspective, we do want to take some of those, uh, those contributing factors and key characteristics into account. So that's really what we're going to focus on here is uh, kind of go through a, a laundry list of what are some of the things that make cancer cells cancer cells. And so I have this list of eight common characteristics that you're going to find in basically all cancers. And uh, I'll go through this list uh, individually, and some of these we'll spend a little bit more time on, dig a little deeper into, but others we have full chapters devoted to later in the book. So we'll just kind of breeze over those for now and come back uh, later. So first we have evasion of growth suppression mechanisms. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to these, these two uh, specific types of growth suppression mechanisms in a minute. Uh, we see cancer cells almost always have an extended lifespan. Many are said to be immortal. Uh, they can basically divide indefinitely. Tumors can induce what's called angiogenesis. We'll discuss that a little bit. Um, tumors can activate invasion and metastasis, so cancer cells can detach from the, the original tumor and spread. Um, cancer cells lose control of the typical cell cycle regulation mechanisms. They're said to be genetically uh, instable, unstable, meaning they're accumulating mutations at a faster rate than normal cells and often uh, are observed to contain more sort of uh, large-scale chromosomal abnormalities. We also find this uh, dysregulation or deregulation of cellular energetics. It's a relatively new finding and is not all that well understood, but it does seem to be a common characteristic. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, cancer cells also have mechanisms for evading the immune system. So there are immune cells that will try to identify and destroy cancer cells but the cancer cells have uh, figured out ways around that. So let's come back up here to number one and talk about evasion of growth suppression mechanisms. So these would be normal mechanisms that would prevent non-cancerous cells from growing too much. And these, these two uh, commonly observed mechanisms are what's called loss of density dependent inhibition of growth and loss of anchorage dependent growth. So what does that mean? Well, if we think of density-dependent inhibition of growth, if you put normal cells in a flask containing uh, culture media, the cells will settle to the bottom, attach to the bottom of the flask, and begin dividing. And they will stop dividing once they have completely covered the, the bottom of the flask. So they've formed what's called a monolayer, basically just a confluent layer of cells. Um, you know, they're sensing that they've run out of space, and that will trigger... Uh, basically the cells to exit the cell cycle and, and uh, cease dividing. Whereas cancer cells won't stop, they will just uh, continue piling up on top of each other, forming basically a tumor in the flask there. And researchers have shown that there's this direct correlation between this, this loss of density-dependent inhibition of growth in cancer cells and the ability of cancers to form tumors in vivo. Okay. And they'll do this typically using animal models. And you'll see this over and over again through the course of the semester, right? Uh, being able to study uh, cancer in mice or, or in rats is, is really critical, especially in the early stages of, of research. So typically what they'll do is inject uh, these, these tumor cells that they're interested in studying into immunocompromised mice. Why immunocompromised? Well, as, as I mentioned a minute ago, right, there are immune cells uh, that can attack and try to destroy cancer cells, so they will intentionally use uh, immunocompromised animals. 
And here's some data from those types of experiments. So if you look at the number of days required for half of the injected animals to develop tumors versus the cell density at which the particular uh, cell type stops growing in culture, you can see uh, that the, the cells that stop growing at a lower density, right, it takes much longer for a tumor to, to form in animals. Whereas those cells that have lost more of that density-dependent inhibition uh, will form tumors very rapidly in these, in these mice. So there is a direct correlation there. And then the second key characteristic was this loss of anchorage-dependent growth. And this is alluding to the fact that normal cells need to be anchored on a substrate. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you see in the flask, right, they need to be anchored to the bottom of the flask. If you were to continually shake that flask, uh, put it on an orbital, orbital shaker in the lab, the cells will not divide well at all if they're forced to remain in suspension, right? They need to be anchored to something. In vivo, they're going to be, as we'll talk about, they're going to be anchored to other tissues or cell layers or extracellular matrix. Um, However, cancer cells have lost this, this dependence on, on uh, needing to be anchored in order to grow. So you shake the flask. If these are cancer cells, they're going to grow just fine in suspension. And so if we think of this in the context of the human body, as I said, normal cells are going to be anchored to extracellular matrix, right, which is this mixture of... Um, proteins, glycoproteins, um, etc. that's outside of the, the cells, things like collagen and fibronectin making up the, the extracellular matrix. I always think of it as sort of a, the light version of a cell wall essentially. Um, uh, whereas the cancer cells, right, are going to be happy dividing um, anywhere, even, for example, in your bloodstream, right? So this is one of the characteristics that will allow cancer cells to metastasize, because a normal cell, if it were to find itself in your bloodstream, is not going to be able to divide, and in fact is probably going to die as it circulates, whereas cancer cells are perfectly happy to keep dividing uh, in the bloodstream. So if we think of the, the extracellular matrix, it has a number of different roles, support, adhesion, of course, which is really kind of what we're focused on here. It's important for cell movement. Basically think of it as the, um, you know, the, the ground, the traction upon, uh, or the, the surface is going to provide traction for cell movement, and can also have some important regulatory roles in terms of cell signaling. Um, so typically, when I say normal cells need to be anchored, if they are not anchored to extracellular matrix or to another cell layer, that will trigger the phenomenon of apoptosis, right? So program cell death, cellular suicide, if you will. And you'll notice in this cartoon here, we have these proteins called integrins or integrins, depending on who you hear pronounce it. But these are transmembrane proteins, so they're embedded in the membrane and they have one portion uh, outside the cell that will interact with the extracellular matrix. They have another portion inside the cell that will interact with the cytoskeleton, active microfilaments primarily. So they're kind of mediating what's going on inside the cell with outside. And so if, you know, if these integrins are, are never able to interact with the uh, extracellular matrix outside the cell, that can trigger apoptosis. So you might ask, okay, well, why is it that cancer cells don't need to adhere? And the bottom line is it's not entirely clear, but there have been some differences identified at the cell surface between normal cells and cancer cells. And, uh, you know, one, one very interesting thing that's been found recently is researchers have identified a number of microRNAs that can uh, reduce the expression of some of these cellular proteins that are important for adhesion. So if you're not familiar with the idea of microRNAs, as the name implies, these are very small, double-stranded RNA molecules. 
Um, and what they will do is they will basically uh, bind to uh, homologous sequences in messenger RNAs and target them for destruction. So they're basically getting rid of certain cellular messenger RNAs. If you get rid of the messenger RNAs, then you're basically also getting rid of those proteins, right? Because the cell is not going to produce the proteins that were encoded for by those genes, uh, by those, those messenger RNAs. So what kind of genes or proteins are these, these uh, microRNAs inhibiting? Well, we see some that are inhibiting these, what are called uh, cadherins, these like cell-to-cell -cell adhesion molecules. You could think of these as kind of like Velcro on the surface of the cell. They can help lock cells together into tissues. We see them inhibiting those integrins that I just showed you on the previous slide that are important for that that basic interaction between cells and the extracellular matrix. Um, we see them inhibiting cytoskeletal proteins, right? So those proteins inside the cell that integrins might be interacting with. Um, and then we see them inhibiting extracellular matrix proteins uh, directly, right? So if we think of this big picture, okay, we're reducing the ability of cells to adhere to extracellular matrix and cancer cells reducing the ability of cells to adhere to each other in cancer cells. We're disrupting the cytoskeleton inside of cancer cells in, in specific ways. And we're also altering the extracellular matrix. So all of that happening through this one mechanism. And then another uh, interesting observation that, that researchers have seen is that cancer cells appear to have fewer gap junctions than normal cells. And if you remember back to uh, you know, discussions in principles of biology or cell biology about cell, cell junctions, gap junctions are communication junctions. So you can think of them as basically like little pores uh, connecting animal cells to each other that will allow small signaling molecules to pass from cytoplasm to cytoplasm. And so what we think is happening is cancer cells are, are getting rid of many of their gap junctions to try to prevent normal cell-to-cell -cell signaling that might otherwise inhibit their growth. And so, for example, you can see here this cluster of cancer cells surrounded by normal cells, um, or sorry, set that backwards, normal cells surrounded by uh, cancer cells. If you inject a fluorescent dye into the, the normal cell in the middle here, you can see it starts spreading cell to cell right through the gap junctions. This will be a, a dye small enough to pass directly through those, those pores. So spreads normal cell to normal cell, but you'll notice none of the cancer cells right, receive that signal, suggesting that they are no longer connected to those normal cells by the gap junctions. And again, the idea is it's kind of Shutting, shutting off that avenue for signaling from the normal healthy cells that might be telling the cancer cells, hey, you're, you're doing it wrong, right? It's time, time for you to undergo apoptosis or stop dividing. They don't want to hear it, so they've, they've uh, basically gotten rid of those gap junctions or at least reduced the number dramatically. Okay, so we've got these, these key mechanisms for evading... Uh, the, the normal ways that growth would be suppressed in healthy cells. And then the second key characteristic is this extended lifespan. And this is referring to the idea that normal cells will divide a certain number of times, you know, either in, in culture, in the lab, or in, in vivo. They have a limited lifespan once they've, once they've divided uh, too many times, quote-unquote they're either going to die or to stop dividing, basically exit the cell cycle completely. And remember I mentioned uh, you know, some of the developmental studies from the nematode C. elegans in chapter one, right? And it, uh, those studies have clearly showed that, yeah, there is a very, uh, very repeatable and defined number of cell divisions that each cell in a multicellular organism will typically go through, excluding repairing damage to tissues or, or something like that.
And so, for example, fibroblasts are a type of cell that have been very well studied in the lab. Um, these are cells that help maintain the extracellular matrix in, in the skin. And, you know, in culture, in the lab, in sort of ideal settings, fibroblasts will divide about 50 or 60 times, and then they will undergo apoptosis. And on the left here, you can see a picture of what uh, healthy fibroblasts would look like, quote unquote, young fibroblasts. And then on the right, we have those that have reached the end of their lifespan, meaning they've, they've gone through those 50 or 60 divisions. And you can see they're, they're not looking so great, right? At this point, they're basically uh, initiating that process of apoptosis and they're going to die, no matter how, how kindly you treat them in culture at that point. Now, this is not the case in cancer cells, so I mentioned cancer cells are often said to be immortal. So for example, HeLa cells, uh, these are cervical cancer cells that were the first uh, human cells able to be cultured. Um, these have been dividing continuously in culture, pardon my spelling error there, for more than 50 years, right? So that's, you know, I don't know how many divisions that is, but you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of divisions. So how can that be, right? Why, why do they not stop like normal cells? And, you know, to answer that question, really to look at some of the normal mechanisms that would stop healthy cells from, from dividing. And one of those key mechanisms is what's called telomere shortening. You may be familiar with this, <clears throat> but this refers to the fact that during the process of DNA replication, right, which happens during, remember, S phase of the cell cycle, so before every cell division, when the cell replicates all of its DNA, uh, DNA polymerase cannot replicate the very end of the chromosomes. So every time we go through that process, we basically shorten the, the chromosomes by the length of what would be one uh, RNA primer that's used during that replication process. And so your cells have accounted for that, your chromosomes have accounted for that shortening by providing what are called telomere sequences at the end of the chromosomes. These are just repetitive DNA sequences. So you see it, the TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG, just repeated over and over again. Um, the, the DNA at the, at the very end of the chromosome also gets wrapped around these capping proteins. So you have these telomere caps at the ends. Um, and those sequences are provided with the intent that, yes, they're going to be gradually chewed away over time as your cells go through rounds of, of DNA replication. And so there's no genes, right? There's no important regulatory sequences out here in the telomeres. But if a cell goes through enough divisions, right, 50, 60 divisions, uh, they will have chewed through all that telomere sequence and we get to the point where we're at risk of now eating into important DNA that actually contains genes, etc. Um, and so once those telomeres get short enough, they can no longer wrap around the capping proteins. We lose that cap and that basically triggers the process of apoptosis and tells that cell, yep, you've, you've divided enough, can't do it anymore, so, so you're done. And there's been a lot of interest in this in recent years because telomere shortening is linked to aging pretty directly, right? So, you know, as, as we live long enough and, and, and get old enough, uh, many of our cells in our body have gone through those 50 or 60 uh, division cycles and they start dying, right? And so that's why, you know, as you get older, you literally start losing muscle mass and, you know, Everybody says, oh, I'm getting old, I'm falling apart. Well, yeah, you sort of are falling apart because your, your cells are, are dying on you due to this process. So how do cancer cells get around this? Well, enter an enzyme called telomerase. So this is an enzyme encoded for in the human genome. You have this, this telomerase gene in every cell in your body, um, but it only gets produced in, in certain cells, usually in like adult stem cells. But what this enzyme can do is it can basically regrow telomeres. Um, and 
if you look, watch the little animation here, you'll see uh, telomerase come in. So there's our, our gap that was left when we removed the primer during DNA replication or shortening of the chromosome. Let's see, give it a second for telomerase. Here it comes. So we'll zoom in there on the, the shortened end of the chromosome. And yeah, here comes the enzyme, and you'll see it's actually loaded with a short RNA molecule that can be then used as a, a template. So it will bind to that shortened end, and we can then elongate using that, uh, that RNA in the telomerase. And so we're basically regrowing, regrowing the telomeres at this point. And so this was such, such an important finding. It was actually awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine a number of years ago. Um, but at any rate, as I said, typically this, this enzyme only gets produced right in adult stem cells. So we can see here now we've added another primer and we're going to be able to fill in the complementary strand to really complete those, the telomere regrowth. So for example, think about, you know, in your adult body, you have uh, uh, adult stem cells in your bone marrow that are constantly producing new blood cells and they need to do that through your entire life and the only way they can do that is by kicking on production of this enzyme and regrowing telomeres and well we see cancer cells have often activated the, the telomerase gene okay so they've turned that on um, even though they you know they're not technically considered stem cells and so they're able to get around that issue of telomere shortening. Um, another, another way cancer cells can get around telomere shortening is just by simply breaking the apoptosis, the programmed cell death uh, mechanism. So even though their telomeres do shorten, they will not die. And just to remind you, right, apoptosis is, is not just a phenomenon you find in sick or, or dying or old cells. So it is, you know, an intentional cell death that can be used, for example, very importantly in embryonic development. So we see this, uh, you know, even in the human hand, if you look early during embryonic development, you see tissue basically webbing between the digits and the fingers. You come back like a week later and that, that tissue is gone, right? So it was basically removed by apoptosis. I always like to use the analogy of like a sculptor, you know, starting with a lump of clay. You don't just make your sculpture by adding, adding more clay to that initial lump, right? You remove things typically to, to get the correct shape. So same kind of thing is going on uh, during multicellular development. Um, so there's a number of different things that can trigger apoptosis. So there could be a signaling molecule called a death ligand might come in and, and trigger that process. Could be damage to the DNA and the nucleus of the cell, misfolded proteins. Um, in, the, in the ER can also trigger that as can, as we just said, telomere shortening. Right. And so unlike necrosis, which would be cell death due to injury where the cells slow, uh, slowly swell and burst and that causes pain and, and pressure, um, apoptosis is a very neat orderly process. So you get what's called cell shrinkage and then cell blebbing, it's literally called, or cell disintegration where the cell starts breaking down into little pieces which are then consumed by phagocytic cells. And so at the end of that process, that cell has just disappeared. It's, it's completely gone. And if, if we think of this uh, in terms of what's happening at the molecular level, um, really what's triggering apoptosis is this cascade of enzymes called caspases. So these are digestive enzymes and you, you get this cascade where one caspase uh, activates the next, etc. And you end up with this whole host of digestive enzymes kind of breaking the cell apart. As we, as we mentioned, there's really two different pathways. There's this external pathway that would come from a ligand, right? The, uh, that death ligand binding to the death receptor triggering apoptosis and that caspase cascade 
or you have an internal pathway that would come from DNA damage or telomere shortening that will go through this p53 protein mediated pathway where the, the DNA damage activates this p53 protein which then activates these death promoting proteins which will poke holes in your mitochondria um, and cytochrome C will leak out of the mitochondria and then that stimulates the caspase cascade and you'll notice you do have this protein here on the surface of your mitochondria. BCL2 is kind of fighting against those death-promoting proteins. So what will often happen in cancer cells is they will break this pathway, right? Typically we're talking about the internal pathway. So, you know, how do they do that? Well, they will mutate p53, for example. So p53 doesn't work anymore. Or they may... Uh, overproduce BCL2, so it does too good a job of blocking these death-promoting proteins, and you just don't get apoptosis, even if you have DNA damage, even if you have telomere shortening. Okay, so then the third uh, characteristic on the list is inducing angiogenesis. Right? And we have a whole uh, chapter coming up, chapter three, we'll, we'll get into angiogenesis in quite a bit more detail, and I'm probably going to have you watch a movie related to angiogenesis research as well. Um, but in a nutshell, angiogenesis, if you're not familiar with that term, is the ability of tumors to recruit their own blood supply. So it's basically the, uh, the production of new branches off of existing blood vessels, right? And it's been shown that... Uh, recruiting blood vessels to a tumor, to a small tumor, is really critical for its ability to grow to a, a large size. You may have a small tumor just a few millimeters in diameter, and it really can't get much bigger than that unless this process of angiogenesis happens. And now that's going to allow more nutrients to get to those uh, cancer cells and uh, cancer cells to get rid of you know, waste, CO2, etc. Um, and will really uh, expediate the, the growth of the tumor. And then the fourth on the list is activation and invasion of metastasis. And again, I'm just going to kind of breeze over this because we'll, we'll go into this some more in Chapter 3 as well. Um, well, we already discussed the fact metastasis is, is often what makes cancer so lethal, right? That ability of tumors to spread throughout the body makes it very, very difficult to contain and treat. Um, but I did just want to introduce the idea that if you think about metastasis happening, right, there's, there's really uh, quite a few steps that have to go on. So you have to have your, your cancer cell has to detach itself from and leave the initial tumor. It's got to move to and enter the bloodstream, survive the journey through the bloodstream, exit, exit the circulatory system, and then start dividing and, and survive at that secondary site to establish a, another tumor. Uh, but as I said, we'll, we'll go through some of those steps in some more detail in Chapter 3. So I'm going to stop there, and then I will uh, have a second part where we'll finish up this chapter.